I'm John Goff, President and CEO of Altius Space Machines, and we are developing a solution that enables nanosat launch providers to deliver payloads directly to space stations. Uh, not only does this unlock a huge new market for them, this also will enable us to achieve 20 to 70 million dollars in annual revenues once we've scaled up to full commercial operations, and ultimately enable us to change the way space deliveries are done forever. Okay, right now, uh, just-in-time payload delivery, or just-in-time small package deliveries are a critical part of the terrestrial economy. However, this capability is not available to uh, space station utilizers such as NanoRacks and their customers. Next slide. Um, existing uh, existing uh, delivery vehicles such as the uh, SpaceX um, Dragon, they work very well for bulk cargo delivery, but just as you wouldn't send a single FedEx package on a 747 all by itself, you wouldn't fly a Dragon with just a single small payload. Right now you have to manifest it in a bigger payload, which by definition makes it no longer just in time. There are currently uh, several companies in the suborbital RLV uh, group and, and elsewhere, such as X-Core Aerospace, Scaled Composites, um, Unreasonable Rocket, uh, Dynetics, that are developing what are called nanosat launch vehicles. These vehicles can put small satellites, things about this big, uh, up into space, and while they're right size for delivering these small payloads to the space station, they currently are unable to do so. Uh, the, the complex delivery vehicles such as Dragon, they don't scale down small enough and actually leave you any payload left over. Just the proximity operation sensors on Dragon alone are bigger than the payloads that we're talking about delivering here. Next slide. So the customer that we're trying to, the customer need we are addressing with Altius Space Machines is this need of how do you, you know, how can we enable these, uh, these nanosat launchers to service this market? If we can uh, enable them to service this market, not only are we opening a huge new market for them, but we're also addressing the needs of space station researchers and manufacturers and ultimately making them more competitive uh, compared to terrestrial counterparts. Next slide. So the solution that Altius has uh, developed, we're calling it our direct to station delivery service. What this does is it offloads the complex delivery functions from the visiting vehicle to the actual space station itself and allowing any rocket to service its own delivery vehicle. Um, next slide. So let me walk you through a quick cartoon of how this works. So first off, you have um, on the space station itself, you have a, uh, a sensor and control system that can tell exactly where the vehicle is and calculate the optimal trajectory. Next slide. Uh, it sends a series of burn commands to that vehicle that allows it to navigate to a safe standoff distance from the space station that is close enough, next slide, to enable our sticky boom, which I'll explain in a second, to reach out, safely grab it, and pull it into the station. Next slide. Okay, this, uh, the sticky boom, for, for lack of a better term, is a mechanical tractor beam. This thing can reach out and stick to almost any object you can think of in space. Uh, metals, plastics, asteroids, any, anything. Uh, we're developing this uh, in collaboration with SRA International here in Silicon Valley who invented the electrotegian technology that we're using uh, to enable this uh, you know, sticking to any surface. Um, the cool thing about this is that while it sounds sci-fi, it's actually real. Uh, we brought a prototype, we fl flight tested this on a zero gravity plane here in Silicon Valley a couple months ago. And if anyone wants to try it out after all the presentations, uh, we'll be out in the hall and we'll run it till the batteries run dry. Uh, next slide. So we have a cool technology, but we've been getting real traction and interest from commercial, uh, from NASA and commercial uh, customers. We're currently working on a NASA contract uh, for Mars sample return. Um, we've also uh, we've also recently joined a Lockheed Martin joint proposal. Uh, for demonstrating a version of uh, this technology for uh, space junk uh, removal that will ultimately provide some of the technologies we need for our direct to station solution. Next slide. And we intend to leverage this trend in, in government and commercial interest to enable us to cover the, use that to cover the R&D expenses of bringing this technology all the way to commercial operations. Once we are in commercial operations, we're looking at a lease fee model where we would lease the hardware and provide operations and maintenance services uh, for the space station operators. 
and then we would charge a fee directly to the delivering vehicles. Um, and as you can see, even at, uh, even at weekly flights, we're getting up into the $20 million, uh, $20 million in annual revenue mark, just from commercial, uh, uh, commercial alone. So the management team we've put together is very well uh, focused on this, uh, on, this, on this marketplace. My background is a co-founder of one of the suborbital rocket companies that's interested in developing these nanosat launch capabilities. Gives me a great insight into this market. And not only that, I'm on a first name basis with the CEOs of almost all of our potential customers. Uh, the rest of the team we pulled together has decades of experience in aerospace uh, sales, marketing, business development, and finance. And uh, our acting CTO has 20 years experience at NASA and in commercial industry uh, developing um, deployable structures very similar to the boom part of our sticky boom. Uh, next slide. So we are raising $400,000 at, at the current time. Uh, the main focus of this, uh, we, we list several near-term things we intend to spend that on. Uh, the big, one big part is securing our IP position. We have a provisional patent already for Sticky Boom, but we want to file full patents for Sticky Boom in our direct to station delivery service so we can lock in our competitive advantage. And ultimately, by, uh, by executing this business plan, we feel we'll be in an excellent position for a merger and acquisition event sometime around when we enter commercial operations at the end of year five. So that's, that's the solution we're providing for nanosat launchers. This is an excellent opportunity for them. This is an excellent, excellent opportunity for us. And it will ultimately allow us to change the way space deliveries are done forever. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. So uh, this is a leasing model. Basically, you'll own the hardware. Yeah. So it's there's a base lease, and then most of the revenue actually comes from the fees that we'd be charging uh, delivering vehicles. Uh, initially, when that's demand's ramping up, the lease is more important. But eventually, most of the revenue, most of the commercial revenue, would come from uh, from the fee service. So, so one of the challenges might be that. You know, this is if you build it, will I come? That you have to somehow fund the, the 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 building and sort of inventory of these things before people actually use them and pay you fees. So, does the business model sort of account for that? How much how much total dollars do you need before you you sort of see revenue okay. coming? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. So, the development of the of the technology, we're using uh, we're leveraging NASA and DoD contracts to help us mature and develop. Uh, and develop our first flight unit. Um, depending, like we're still investigating the best way of implementing the, the lease structure. Um, we may end up needing to do an extra funding around several years down the road to, to finance that, but we may be able to bootstrap it directly off of these contracts. All right, thank you. Yeah. I was wondering if you can talk about the market for nanosat launchers. Um, maybe briefly comment on kind of when you think nanosat launchers will become more mainstream, what the trends are, how big will the nanosat market be in five years? Okay. Give us kind of a picture on that. Okay, yeah. Uh, actually, w when I started Altius Space Machines, I actually thought I was starting a nanosat launch uh, company. We, we discovered Sticky Boom about a month later, and we've been off to the races since then. Um, but that market, you know, it's focused on, you, you've got educational segments, you have uh, military defense and science segments where I think that's where the main growth potential is, like launching small. And we're not talking about CubeSats per se. We're talking about things maybe about 10 to 20 kilograms that are doing Earth observation, uh, communication, things like that. Uh, one, of, one of the people I've worked with um, was, work, was involved with the NASA NanoSat, or sorry, Army NanoSat uh, group down at Huntsville, down at Redstone Arsenal. And they were working on trying to develop these. Their goal was to be able to put up a small constellation of these Earth observation satellites and communication satellites at the start of a conflict. Um, the, the market for that, th there, is a, there is a market for nanosat uh, launch capability. I don't know the exact numbers. We're probably talking on the order of eventually getting up to you know, 10s, 20s, 30s of launches per year, maybe more. Um, but this. Like this market is actually potentially bigger than all of their other markets combined. 
like this unlocks a key new area that they can't currently access by themselves. Yeah. This, can the average spacecraft withstand being grabbed by something? Are you at risk of pulling panels off? Do you need some, I mean, the, the idea of this is that it's, it doesn't matter whether the other guy has mm -hmm. your hardware, but you don't want to break his spacecraft at the same time. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the pulling force that this provides is actually pretty gentle. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the technical development is going to be around figuring out the best way to do the control and not pulling too hard so that the pads come undone from the, from the target not, or, or damaging it, things like that. that. That's part of what we're trying to use these NASA contracts to help us uh, mature. Well, that, I think, leads into my next question. In your business plan, you said you had uh, received $200,000 to date, I think, from mm -hmm. ULA, DARPA, and JPL. Yeah. And you were expecting a total of $1.6 million by the end of the year from identified opportunities. Can you talk a little bit about, um, well, first of all, what are the, the applications of ULA, DARPA, and JPL, what, why are they paying you money? And secondly, for the, yeah. the balance of the 1.6 million, sort of who's that coming from and what are they looking for from Sticky Boom? Okay, uh, good question. Yeah, the uh, ULA contract was uh, working on some um, Centaur upper stage uh, guidance and control applications, which are actually very relevant to the, uh, you're figuring out how to do this, um, doing the burns and stuff you need to do for the direct to station deliveries. Um, the DARPA project, we were actually building the avionics set for one of the nanosat launch providers, uh, building the, avi the computer brains for the upper stage of one of these providers. Uh, the JPL project is for capturing a small uh, Mars sample return canister in Mars orbit. Um, so all of these are providing pieces of the puzzle that, that feed into the end system. Uh, the, other, the other contracts that we are, you know, have you know, have in the pipeline that we're working on, uh, that we're working on finalizing would be, uh, we're working on, um, well, we have the Lockheed Martin uh, proposal that we're in, and that's for, as I was saying, maturing a, uh, maturing the flight readiness status, uh, a um, sticky boom, t uh, sti a sticky boom like solution for orbital debris removal. Um, we're also looking at a range of other smaller contracts for uh, developing different different facets and aspects of the end solution. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> Thanks. How large is the solution going around the ISS that you're going to grab out of fire? Oh, yeah, yeah. You actually need to guide the vehicle into, into the area that's, you know, that's currently controlled by visiting vehicles. It, it doesn't get around that, but it allows us to offload the visiting vehicles requirements from the nanosat launch provider more towards our side of the solution space. Could, could there be an eventually a kind of standardized sealed hatch that I could walk through at some point in the future from this? Um, what we're, like for, for these small payloads, we're actually envisioning a solution that would use, uh, the Japanese experimental module has this equipment airlock and we're actually planning on things that are small enough that you could actually just fit it in through the airlock so it's not you're not bolting it to the side of the station and opening a hatch. You're actually passing it in through a hatch that already exists on the space station. Uh, but yeah, you could eventually scale this up to solution. Like this scales up all the way to space shuttle sized uh, payloads um, in the future. And you're talking about maturing your flight unit. What's your time frame for getting a unit flying? Okay, um, like to actually get it into space operations. Um, we're looking at, we're probably looking at two to three years out. Uh, it, it depends on the flight opportunity. Uh, the space station has a lot of additional certs and requirements that we'll have to work through that could take longer, but we're targeting about three years. Okay. Yeah. As I understand it, some of the IP belongs to SRI and some, some you're developing. Mm -hmm. um, where are you in terms of a, a licensing agreement with SRI? Yeah. Uh, obviously, the, the terms of that could affect your business model. Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of tell us what they own, what you own. Okay, yeah, uh, right now, um, you know, this is the area that we're actively negotiating with SRI. We're also trying to get a, you know, strategic partnership relationship, not just the, not just the licensing structure. They're helping us develop, you know, n not just electric adhesion aspects, but also potentially some other um, details of, uh, of making, you know, the, the compliance structure work and everything else. So they own the underlying technology for electro adhesion and as well some complementary technologies which we may be taking advantage of. 
uh, we developed Sticky Boom and uh, yeah, we developed Sticky Boom and Direct to Station. And there's also some overlapping areas that we both have some ownership, so we'll probably be doing some uh, joint patents with them as well. But a lot of those details are still in active negotiation. Um.